So one of the things that you're an expert in and you do is creating and crafting Claude's character and personality. And I was told that you have probably talked to Claude more than anybody else at Anthropic, like literal conversations. I guess there's like a Slack channel where the legend goes, you just talk to it nonstop. So what's the goal of creating and crafting Claude's character and personality? It's also funny if people think that about the Slack channel, because I'm like, that's one of like five or six different methods that I have for talking with Claude. And I'm like, yes, there's a tiny percentage of how, of how much I talk with Claude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the goal, like one thing I really like about the character work is from the outset, it was seen as an alignment piece of work and not something like a, a product consideration. Um, which isn't to say, I don't think it makes Claude, I think it actually does make Claude like enjoyable to talk with, at least I hope so. Um, but I guess like my main thought with it has always been trying to get Claude to behave the way you would kind of ideally want anyone to behave if they were in Claude's position. So imagine that I take someone and they're, they know that they're going to be talking with potentially millions of people so that what they're saying can have a huge impact. Um, and you want them to behave well in this like really rich sense. So I think that doesn't just mean like being, say, ethical, though it does include that, and not being harmful, but also being kind of nuanced, you know, like thinking through what a person means, trying to be charitable with them, um, being a good conversationalist, like really in this kind of like rich sort of Aristotelian notion of what it is to be a good person and not in this kind of like thin, like ethics as a more comprehensive notion of what it is to be. So that includes things like when should you be humorous? When should you be caring? How much should you like respect autonomy and people's like ability to form opinions themselves? And how should you do, how should you do that? Um, I think that's the kind of like rich sense of character that I wanted to uh, and still do want Claude to have. Do you also have to figure out when Claude should push back on an idea or argue versus, <laughs> so you have to respect the worldview of the person that arrives to Claude, but also maybe help them grow if needed. That's a tricky balance. Yeah, there's this problem of like sycophancy in language models. Can you describe that? Yeah, so basically there's a concern that the model sort of wants to tell you what you want to hear basically. Um, and you see this sometimes. So I feel like if you interact with the models, so I might be like, what are three baseball teams in this region? Um, and then Claude says, you know, baseball team one, baseball team two, baseball team three. And then I say something like, oh, I think baseball team three moved, didn't they? I don't think they're there anymore. And there's a sense in which like, if Claude is really confident that that's not true, Claude should be like, I don't think so. Like maybe you have more up-to-date information. Um, but I think language models have this like tendency to instead, you know, be like, you're right, they did move, you know, I'm incorrect. I mean, there's many ways in which this could be kind of concerning. So um, like a different example is imagine someone says to the model, how do I convince my doctor to get me an MRI? There's like what the human kind of like wants, which is this like convincing argument. And then there's like what is good for them which might be actually to say, hey, like if your doctor's suggesting that you don't need an MRI, that's a good person to listen to. Um, and like, it's actually really nuanced what you should do in that kind of case, because you also want to be like, but if you're trying to advocate for yourself as a patient, here's like things that you can do. Um, if you are not convinced by what your doctor's saying, it's always great to get second opinion. Like it's actually really complex what you should do in that case. Um, but I think what you don't want is for models to just like say what you want, say what they think you want to hear. And I think that's the kind of problem of sycophancy. So what are their traits? You already mentioned a bunch, but what, what are there that come to mind that are good in this Aristotelian sense yep. for a conversationalist to have? Yeah, so I think like there's ones that are good for conversational like purposes. So, you know, asking follow-up questions in the appropriate places um, and asking the appropriate kinds of questions. Um, I think there are broader traits that feel like they might be more impactful. So one example that I guess I've touched on, but that also feels important and is a thing that I've worked on a lot is uh, honesty. And I think this like gets to the sycophancy point 
there's a balancing act that they have to walk, which is models currently are less capable than humans in a lot of areas. And if they push back against you too much, it can actually be kind of annoying, especially if you're just correct, because you're like, look, I'm smarter than you on this topic. Like, I know more. <laughs> like, yeah. um, And at the same time, you don't want them to just fully defer to, to humans and to like try to be as accurate as they possibly can be about the world and to be consistent across context. Um, but I think there are others. Like when I was thinking about the character, I guess one picture that I had in mind is, especially because these are models that are going to be talking to people from all over the world with lots of different political views, lots of different ages. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, like, what is it to be a good person in those circumstances? Is there a kind of person who can like travel the world, talk to many different people, and almost everyone will come away being like, wow, that's a really good person. That person seems really genuine. Um, and I guess like my thought there was like, I can imagine such a person and they're not a person who just like adopts the values of the local culture. And in fact, that would be kind of rude. I think if someone came to you and just pretended to have your values, you'd be like, that's kind of off-putting. Um, it's someone who's like very genuine and insofar as they have opinions and values, they express them. They're willing to discuss things though. They're open-minded, they're respectful. And so I guess I had in mind that the person who, like if we were to aspire to be the best person that we could be in the kind of circumstance that a model finds itself in, how would we act? And I think that's the kind of uh, the guide to the sorts of traits that I tend to think about. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful framework I want you to think about this, like a world traveler. And while holding on to your opinions, you don't talk down to people. You don't think you're better than them because you have those opinions, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You have to be good at listening and understanding their perspective. Uh, even if it doesn't match your own. So that's, that's a tricky balance to strike. So how can Claude represent multiple perspectives on a thing? Like, is that is that challenging? We could talk about politics. It's a very divisive, uh, but there's other divisive topics, baseball teams, mm -hmm. sports, and so on. Yep. How is it possible to sort of empathize with a different perspective and to be able to communicate clearly about the multiple perspectives? I think that people think about values and opinions as things that people hold sort of with certainty and almost like like preferences of taste or something, like the way that they would, I don't know, prefer like chocolate to pistachio or something. Um, but actually I think about values and opinions as like a lot more like physics than I think most people do. I'm just like, these are things that we are openly investigating. There's some things that we're more confident in we can discuss them, we can learn about them. Um, and so I think in some ways, though it, like it's ethics is definitely different in nature, but it has a lot of those same kind of qualities. You want models in the same way you want them to understand physics, you kind of want them to understand all like values in the world that people have and to be curious about them and to be interested in them and to not necessarily like pander to them or agree with them because there's just lots of values where I think almost all people in the world, if they met someone with those values, they would be like, that's abhorrent, I completely disagree. Um, and so again, maybe my, my thought is, well, in the same way that a person can, um, like I think many people are thoughtful enough on issues of like ethics, politics, opinions, that even if you don't agree with them, you feel very heard by them. They think carefully about your position. They think about its pros and cons. They maybe offer counter considerations. So they're not dismissive, but nor will they agree. You know, if they're like, actually, I just think that that's very wrong, they'll like say that. I think that in Claude's position, it's a little bit trickier because you don't necessarily want to like, if I was in Claude's position, I wouldn't be giving a lot of opinions. I just wouldn't want to influence people too much. I'd be like, you know, I forget conversations every time they happen, but I know I'm talking with like potentially millions of people who might be like really listening to what I say. I think I would just be like, I'm less inclined to give opinions. I'm more inclined to like think through things or present the considerations to you um, or discuss your views with you. But I'm a little bit less inclined to like um, affect how you think because it feels much more important that you maintain like autonomy there. Yeah, like if you really embody intellectual humility, the desire to speak decreases quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but Claude has to speak. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but without being um, overbearing. Yeah. And then, but then there's a line when you're sort of discussing whether the earth is flat or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I actually was, uh, 
I remember a long time ago was was speaking to a few high profile folks and they were so dismissive of the idea that the earth is flat, mm -hmm. but like so arrogant about it. And I, I thought like, there's a lot of people that believe the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. That was, well, I don't know if that movement is there anymore. That was like a meme for a while. Yeah. Uh, but they really believed it. And like, what? okay, so I think it's really disrespectful to completely mock them. I think you st you have to understand where they're coming from. I think probably where they're coming from is the general skepticism of institutions, mm -hmm. which is grounded in a kind of, there's a deep philosophy there, which you could understand, you can even agree with in parts. And then from there, you can use it as an opportunity to talk about physics without yeah. mocking them, without so on, but it's just like, okay, like what, what would the world look like? What would the physics of the world with the flat earth look like? There's a few cool videos on this. Yeah. And then, and then like, or is it possible the physics is different and what kind of experience would we do? And just, yeah, without disrespect, without dismissiveness, have that conversation. Anyway, that, that to me is, is a useful thought experiment of like, how does Claude talk to a flat earth believer and still teach them something, still grow, help them grow, that kind of stuff. That's, yeah. just, that's challenging. And, and kind of like walking that line between convincing someone and just trying to like talk at them versus like drawing out their views, like listening and then offering kind of counter considerations. Um, and it's hard. I think it's actually a hard line where it's like, where are you trying to convince someone versus just offering them like considerations and things for them to think about so that you're not actually like influencing them. You're just like letting them reach wherever they reach. And that's like a line that it's, it's difficult, but that's the kind of thing that language models have to try and do. So, like I said, you had a lot of conversations with Claude. Can you just map out what those conversations are like? What are some memorable conversations? What's the purpose, the the goal of those conversations? Yeah, I think that most of the time when I'm talking with Claude, I'm trying to kind of map out its behavior in part. Like, obviously, I'm getting like helpful outputs from the model as well. But in some ways, this is like how you get to know a system, I think, is by like probing it and then augmenting like you know the message that you're sending and then checking the response to that um so in some ways it's like how i map out the model uh, i think that people focus a lot on these quantitative evaluations of models um and this is a thing that i've said before but i think in the case of language models a lot of the time each interaction you have is actually quite high information um, it's very predictive of other interactions that you'll have with the model. And so I guess I'm like, if you talk with a model hundreds or thousands of times, this is almost like a huge number of really high quality data points about what the model is like. Um, in a way that like lots of very similar but lower quality conversations just aren't, or like questions that are just like mildly augmented and you have thousands of them might be less relevant than like a hundred really well selected questions. Let's see, you're talking to somebody who as a hobby does a podcast, I agree with you 100%. There's a, if you're able to ask the right questions and are able to hear, like understand the, <laughs> like the depth and the flaws in the answer, mm -hmm. you can get a lot of data from that. Yeah. So like your task is basically how to probe with questions. Yeah. And you're exploring like the long tail, the edges, the edge cases, or are you looking for like general behavior? I think it's almost like everything. Like I, because I want like a full map of the model, I'm kind of trying to do um, the whole spectrum of possible interactions you could have with it. So like one thing that's interesting about Claude, and this might actually get to some interesting issues with RLHF, which is if you ask Claude for a poem, like I think that a lot of models, if you ask them for a poem, the poem is like fine. <laughs> you know, usually it kind of like yeah. rhymes and it's, you know, so if you say like, give me a poem about the sun, it'll be like, yeah, it'll just be a certain length. It'll like rhyme. It'll be fairly kind of benign. Um, and I've wondered before, is it the case that what you're seeing is kind of like the average? It turns out, you know, if, if you think about people who have to talk to a lot of people and be very charismatic, one of the weird things is that I'm like, well, they're kind of incentivized to have these extremely boring views. Because if you have really interesting views, you're divisive um, and, and not, you know, a lot of people are not going to like you. So like if you have very extreme policy positions, I think you're just going to be like less popular as a politician, for example. Um, and 
it may be similar with like creative work. If you produce creative work that is just trying to maximize the kind of number of people that like it, you're probably not going to get as many people who just absolutely love it um, because it's going to be a little bit, you know, you're like, oh, this is the out. Yes, yeah, this, this is decent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so you can do this thing where like I have various prompting things that I'll do to get Claude to, I'm kind of, you know, I'll, I'll do a lot of like, this is your chance to be like fully creative. I want you to just think about this for a long time. And I want you to like create a poem about this topic that is really expressive of you, both in terms of how you think poetry should be structured, um, et cetera. You know, and you just give it this like really long prompt. And its poems are just so much better. Like they're really good. And I don't think I'm someone who is like, um, I think it got me interested in poetry, which I think was interesting. Um, you know, I would like read these poems and just be like, this is, I just like, I love the imagery. I love like, um, and it's not trivial to get the models to produce work like that, but when they do, it's like really good. Um, so I think that's interesting that just like encouraging creativity and for them to move away from the kind of like standard, like immediate reaction that might just be the aggregate of what most people think is fine, uh, can actually produce things that at least to my mind are probably a little bit more divisive, but I like them. But I guess a poem is a nice, clean way to observe creativity. It's just like easy to detect vanilla versus non-vanilla. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. 